Okay, cool. All right. Welcome to redefining burnout, redefining productivity during burnout. All right, let's get this started here. I'm going to kick it off with a little story time. Once upon a time, there was a good little dog who built websites and loved solving problems. She was a hard worker and loved her job, but after working so hard and so long, things begin to change. When she woke up in the morning, her heart would race and her mind would race through all of the things she had to do, and she did not want to get out of bed. Every morning, she would go for a run around the neighborhood, but she found that she couldn't breathe before she even started. When she spent time with friends, she had trouble focusing and being present in the moment, and dogs are known for living in the moment, right? At work, she started finding it difficult to think or solve problems. And as I said, problem solving was her thing, like her superpower. It was like trying to work in another language. She thought, something is wrong with my brain. Maybe a brain boosting supplement will fix my brain. A very illogical thought for a very logical puppy. Then one day she sat at her desk. She was a lead developer, estimating, creating tickets, doing back-end development on three projects. Project A had one front-end developer every other week for four hours, and the client just asked for a new feature with a quick turnaround. Project B had a team of developers, but an endless cycle of new complex features and quick deadlines. And Project C had one other back-end developer, but there was a fixed, impossible deadline. She was also three weeks away from Drupal Camp Asheville, where she was lead organizer. Our poor puppy was frozen with so many competing priorities. She didn't know what to do. She had to drop some of the balls she had been juggling, and she felt like such a failure. But in the words of Barack Obama, you can't let your failures define you. You have to let your failures teach you. Our puppy didn't fail alone. It wasn't all her fault. She wasn't set up for success but she did say yes to too many things and she wasn't managing her stress. Yes, the puppy is me. Hi, my name is April Sides. I am a senior developer at Lullabot and I'm also the lead organizer of Drupal Camp Asheville. And today I'm here to talk about burnout. So what is burnout? There's a great resource at helpguide.org where I've pulled a lot of the basic information about burnout. So you should check that out. The Help Guide page states, uh, burnout is a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. And I want to emphasize excessive and prolonged stress. It occurs when you feel overwhelmed, emotionally drained, and unable to meet constant demands. So what does it feel like? There are physical signs and symptoms like feeling tired and drained most of the time, lowered immunity, frequent illness, frequent headaches or muscle pains. I have what I call like stress neck where my head gets all tense back here and I'm moving my neck around, my jaw pops, my jaw's all tight. Change in appetite or sleep habits. You know, I have a tendency to eat to avoid work or I have trouble going to sleep at night and then waking up in the morning. And I added a couple here too, um, shaky hands and eye twitches. Like I'll be, if I'm like doing too much at one time, my hands will physically start shaking. And I'm sure everybody's at some point felt the whole eye twitching thing. That's a really weird thing. And then this feeling like you can't breathe, right? So you start doing these big sighs. You're like, <sighs> you just, you just all day, you're just sighing and you just can't breathe. And there's emotional signs and symptoms. You have a sense of failure and self-doubt. You feel like you're not good enough, you can't cut it. Everyone else can do it, but I can't, right? Feeling helpless, trapped and defeated. You know, like you don't have control or there's no end in sight. Um, there's not enough time for all the things. And detachment, feeling alone in the world. Loss of motivation. You know, if I'm really stressed out, I have times where I just do not want to sit at the computer. I'll do anything to not sit at the computer. Increasingly cynical and the negative outlook. You know, there's nothing I can do about this. 
decreased satisfaction and sense of accomplishment. And lack, I've added this lack of emotion or emotional regulation. So your emotions can be very flat, where you just kind of like don't feel anything, or you're on an emotional roller coaster, like everything sets you off or makes you sad or mad or whatever. Just the lack of emotional control. And then there are behavioral signs and symptoms. So you'd be withdrawing from responsibilities. And this could even mean like, withdrawing from your home responsibilities of like keeping a clean house or that sort of thing. Isolating yourself from others. Procrastinating, taking longer to get things done. You know, I have times when I can't focus, think and solve problems and my brain feels broken. So it takes longer to do things. Um, using food, drugs or alcohol to cope. You know, this could be relying on stimulants to be productive or relying on depressants to go to sleep at night. Taking out your frustrations on others. You know, this could come from a lowered emotional intelligence and that emotional regulation. And skipping work or coming in late or leaving early. You know, just avoiding the stress and avoiding the environment where you are stressed. So I often tell people when I'm burning out or sort of trending toward burning out that I'm treading water, right? So I'm gonna go into a little bit deeper here with you and say we're treading water in the middle of the ocean with nothing in sight and it feels like you're sinking. That's what burnout feels like for me. Um, and definitely being in the ocean and feeling like you're sinking is very, you can't breathe. So that kind of associates it with, I can't really breathe in this moment. So who is at risk? perfectionistic people, right? A person who refuses to accept any standard short of perfect. Someone who is pessimistic, you know, thinks negatively or even has negative self-talk. People who are controlling, or you, you need to be in control or you have this need to do it yourself. High achievers are hardworking and successful, give 110%, no pain, no gain, right? And then I added a couple here, people pleasers. You know, they want to make and keep others happy. And selfless and caring people, you know, people who put others before themselves or they take one for the team, right? And, and all these characteristics are not horrible in and of themselves, right? And you may have one or two or you're like me and you have them all and that's okay, right? Um, because you're predisposed, not predetermined, right? Just because all you have some of these characteristics doesn't mean that you're destined to burn out. You're just more likely than someone who doesn't have these characteristics. So what are the causes? There are work-related causes. You know, feeling like you have little or no control of your work. Um, lack of recognition or reward for good work. Unclear or overly demanding job expectations. You know, I find that when I work remotely, I have a hard time knowing if I'm doing too much or if I'm not doing enough and trying to get that kind of gauge as well. And working in a chaotic or high pressure environment. And there are lifestyle causes. Working too much without enough time for socializing or relaxing. Lack of close supported relationships taking on too many responsibilities without enough help from others, and not getting enough sleep. So then there are a few things that have been uh, causes specifically for me, which I call counterproductive productivity. You know, these are things that we think make us more productive, maybe in the short term, but actually make us less productive in the long term. Notifications, you know, notifications are great in moderation. So our brains have been conditioned to receive a dopamine rush or a, or a stress response every time we receive a notification. You know, we want to know everything now. We want that immediate gratification. But every notification breaks our focus, and it takes about 25 minutes to regain our focus after the distraction. And everyone loves a good Slack integration, but this is one of the things that really, I think, affected me when I was burning out, is that we had automated notifications going into Slack. And Slack is a chat app, if you're not familiar. Um, we had automated notifications coming in from like when people would create tickets or close tickets and things like that. 
and they were in the same channel as discussions with the team. And so I would spend all day playing slack-a-mole between my three projects and it affected my ability to focus. Um, so I had Slack notifications on my watch and my phone. Um, during my morning run, I would receive work notifications triggering a stress response and it was just no good. So we wanna manage our notifications, right? We wanna remove frequent no notifications. Um, I've cut back a lot of notifications like Email, I don't need to know that I just received spam. Uh, social media, I'll only keep like the badge icon. So when I pick up my phone, I know I have messages or whatever. Um, I still have calendar notifications on to remind me about calls, uh, going to calls. And uh, very recently though, I turned off the badge notification on my laptop for Slack because I have Slack up. And if I don't want to see Slack, if I want to focus, I don't need to know that I'm getting messages in my dock. Um, I will go and look at Slack when I need to know that. So that was kind of a cool thing I found recently. Um, use do not disturb mode. So I also use the bedtime setting on my iPhone, which will enable do not disturb mode during my sleep hours that are set. Um, I also have enabled a setting that automatically turns on do not disturb mode when I start a workout, which was the best thing ever to work out and not be triggered by stress, right? Um, so when you when you need to focus, disabling notifications is a great place to start. But you can also try website and app blockers. You know, block yourself from websites and apps that you find yourself distracted by, or um, now you can set app limits for different things. So I've, I've been playing around with that on my phone. Um, you know, do what works for you, make adjustments as needed. Um, task switching, okay. There is no such thing as multitasking. There's no such thing as multitasking, okay? There's only the illusion of it. Our brains are not designed to multitask, so we task switch, right? And so even computers task switch, they just do it really, really fast. So what do we do when our computer slows, slows down or the battery's low? We start closing all our browser tabs, our applications, et cetera, right? When that doesn't work, we have to repair or replace the computer. So task switching requires energy and causes wear and tear. And doing it a lot can cause damage to computers and the human brain. So if we want to think about the, the replacement cycle of technology, you know, the smartphones, it's about two and a half years. For laptops, between three and five years. But the human brain is irreplaceable. You know, don't abuse your brain like a computer or a smartphone because no one can replace you. So what are the effects of task switching? Task switching can cause damage to the brain in the region of, that is responsible for empathy and emotional control. Just like notifications, it causes interruptions and time is lost in regaining focus. So that's lost productivity, right? It reduces concentration and focus. The switching causes a dopamine addicted feedback loop. You know, for me, I actually have moments where my eyes start darting, like literally darting from place to place. They can't stay in one place. I can't stay focused. Um, or I'll have disjointed conversations where I switch topics after every sentence. Uh, it's kind of weird. Test switching also lowers your IQ and your emotional intelligence. It causes stress, anxiety, overwhelm, and guess what? Burnout. It affects your impulse control and your decision making. It also affects your creativity because creativity requires concentration. So don't freak out yet. We'll talk about how to repair the brain with self-care. So I used to think I was most productive in my office with my laptop screen and my second monitor. Um, so much room for so many activities, right? We think we, if we need, we think we need a wall of monitors to be the most productive. Um, but what happens is we'll think, oh, I can put Slack over here and I can put email over here and this dashboard over here. So then when I'm working, I can keep up with everything. Uh, it just creates more distraction, right? You just set yourself up. Um, just, you're filling your screen with distractions, right? Or we think, well, I can do something on this screen while I'm compiling or building or whatever on this machine. I can do something over here while that's doing that and you feel more productive. But if you keep doing that, you still have to check on it. Like you still have to be aware of it. 
Um, so multiple monitors can be useful when you do need to maybe compare, when you're doing the same task, you're comparing stuff uh, in QA or you're writing code and you're refreshing over here to see what happens. Um, things like that are where, are where it's helpful or like being creative and you need more space for drawing and things like that. Um, but when you start to feel yourself task switching, try to downsize to one screen. It becomes very apparent when you're task switching and it makes it a lot harder to do so because you actually have to cover up each thing that you're working on. It's not all available to you. Um, so yeah. So how do we avoid burnout? First, self-care is so important. The best self-care comes in the form of good habits. So start by taking an inventory of your current habits, your good, neutral, and bad habits. And then focus on one change at a time. You know, don't try to change everything at once. So pick um, a bad habit to remove or add a new self-care habit. And then I highly recommend Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's an excellent book. Um, in the book, he talks about how to build good habits by making them obvious attractive, easy, and satisfying. And then breaking bad habits by making them invisible, unattractive, difficult, and unsatisfying. He also talks about uh, habit stacking, kind of like an if this, then that, but it's more like after this existing habit, then do the new habit. And it makes it uh, a little bit easier to start a good habit. All right, so we need to form good habits that take care of our body, right? So we need good, good sleep habits. Getting enough sleep, um, adjusting your sleep schedule. You know, right now I'm retraining myself to get up to an alarm and not snooze for an hour. And also not social media scroll before getting up in an effort to get my work day started before noon. It's a process. We also want good nutrition habits, all right? Healthy eating and hydration, the frequency of eating and portion size. Uh, when I recovered from my burnout, the story that I told previously, um, I turned eating two fun size Milky Way bars after lunch every day and to having an afternoon strawberry banana smoothie because I wanted to add more fruit to my diet and I could take a break from the computer in the afternoon. And right now I am well aware that I need to work on my snacking habits. So we also need good exercise habits. You know, this could be as simple as going for a walk. Um, you could do strength training, yoga, sports, cardio fitness. Um, when I quit my high stress job, I shed, I shedded the stress in about 10 pounds just after quitting. And I was able to add multiple hills to my run and beat my times. It was amazing how much the stress was holding me back. All right, so we also need to form habits that will take care of our minds. Right. Relaxation habits are very important. You know, this could look like uh, an adult coloring book. You know, the new hotness of the adult coloring books could be listening to music, you know, watching a movie, journaling, meditating, whatever relaxes you. And I just want to point out that meditation doesn't really look like this to me. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you do what works for you. Right. So instead of the perfect sitting posture in the perfect outdoor location, I prefer to lay on my back for better body relaxation. Um, I can meditate in my bed, on the couch, in my office, wherever. Uh, I once meditated on an airplane and in an airport. Remember those things? So when I meditate, I imagine this is what it looks like in my head. You know, it's not about having a perfectly clear head and focused mind. It's a workout for your brain, building your focus muscles. Every time a thought pops into your head, stop it or kick it out. Uh, that's one repetition. Right, so you can meditate for as little as one minute. Um, so I like to not even track the time uh, because time is kind of a stressor for me. So maybe you wanna count those repetitions if that's the way you wanna go. Um, the key to remember is that when you breathe in through your nose, expand your belly, not your chest. You know, we have a tendency when we're stressed out that we, you know, we wanna get a deep breath into our chest. But what actually happens is that you're stimulating the fight or flight response system and it makes your body more tense and increases your stress. But when you breathe into your belly, when you feel your belly come out with your inhale, uh, it relaxes your muscles, it calms your nerves, and helps release endorphins in your body that reduce pain. There are a ton of apps out there, like Headspace, that was probably the first one I checked out, Calm, 
uh, Fitbit now has a mindfulness feature. My Apple Watch reminds me to breathe several times a day when I don't dismiss it. Um, so while I don't have a meditation habit right now, this was very helpful for me when I was recovering from task switching and induced uh, task switching induced burnout. And I do it as needed when I feel unable to focus. You know, meditation is something that can heal the brain when we were talking about damaging the brain with the task switching. So we also want to incorporate play into our lives. You know, it's a great way to manage stress. You know, I like to play video games or build Lego. Uh, you could play board games with friends and family, put together a puzzle, things that have like problem solving, uh, just free play with your kids or pets, you know, whatever sounds fun. And we also want to build connection with the world around us. You know, we want to spend time with people, spend time with pets and animals, be in nature. And if you can't get into nature right now, um, consider getting some houseplants. And then you can also find spiritual connection and whatever that means for you. So in addition to self-care, we can learn to work smarter. And we can start by building caring relationships with the people we work for and with. And this will make it a lot easier to raise flags when something's wrong. You know, I have a tendency to be very shy with people that I don't know very well. So when I started at Lullabot, I made an effort to get to know my manager because I knew it would be easier for me to speak up and be honest uh, when things weren't okay, right? But it also makes it easier for others to see when you're, you aren't your normal self because you don't know your limit until you've reached it. And it's sometimes hard to know that you're burning out when you're in it. Um, so build the caring support, the caring support you may need uh, to check in on you, right? I highly recommend, oh, I didn't hit my buttons there. Highly recommend checking out Radi Radical Candor. Um, it mostly focuses on the manager perspective, but there's a lot of great stuff in there for everyone. Like realizing you can't be ambitious at work and outside of work, that's another recipe for a burnout. So we can also manage our time and energy. So you want to schedule time blocks for work and self-care. This will help you uh, avoid task switching and make self-care another part of your day. I highly recommend the book, Deep Work. It has great tips on working without distraction. A few of these things came from that. Um, don't respond immediately to emails and messages, right? Let your immediate response be the exception, not the rule in times of emergency. At the same time, don't expect others to respond immediately as well, right? That's a hard one, but I think it creates a culture of humanness. And leave work at work. So Deep Work talks about having a shutdown routine that signals the end of your day. Set boundaries and say no. Um, there's a whole chapter in 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do about how to say no for my fellow people pleasers. I know you're out there. Uh, the book says, if yes has become your automatic answer, start saying, I'll have to look into that and get back to you. Then take a few minutes to consider what you want to do before you make any promises, right? So for the record, I struggle a lot with these things uh, because time is a stressor for me, but I'm always working to get better. So we want to manage our product projects too. So this is like a project management perspective, but also like if you're a freelancer or you're doing your own project, things to think about. You make sure you have clearly defined deadlines and milestones and that your team is aware of them. Manage the pace of work to ensure that you and your team don't burn out. And then consider using agile software development methodology. Um, so agile development is all about iteration. You know, you plan in sprints that are usually about two weeks, you plan the work. And then uh, probably most important for pre preventing team burnout is retrospectives, because you can adjust the rules of development as you go and in ways uh, that work best for the team, right, for the project and the team. So it might be that you need to work really hard on one or two sprints to meet a deadline, but you can follow up with one or two easier sprints to give the team a break. Um, so if you're not familiar with Agile, there are a ton of resources and certification trainings available on the interwebs. All right, so how do we get out of it? Or how, you know, if we're trending toward burnout, treading water, drowning, et cetera, how do we get out of it, right? The quickest way is to stop everything, right? It's not always ideal. It's not always an option. But for extreme cases where your health is compromised, you may not have a choice. 
if you can't stop everything, we want to identify the light at the end of the tunnel for when you can schedule time off. And this may require working with your manager or client. So you can start by reviewing your priorities, find one focused, you know, top priority to focus on, and delegate or postpone the other responsibilities. You know, if it happens to be home responsibilities, you know, think about having a house cleaner or a dog walker, something like that. If it's work responsibilities, delegate your work to your team or consider paying a contractor, right? And think about this as being temporary. You know, this is just to get you through to your time off. Also determine what and when is done. So if you have arbitrary deadlines, adjust them. You know, don't kill yourself uh, trying to reach an arbitrary deadline. Deadlines are great, but they can be moved if they're arbitrary. Um, if you need a Band-Aid fix, see if you can take a long weekend. You know, uh, I did that a couple of times this summer because I couldn't take a full week off. So recovery takes time. So the more time you can take off and focus on self-care, the faster the recovery. So when you take time off, take time off. All right, so once you've identified the light at the end of the tunnel and you've identified your top priority, we're going to communicate with the team, right? We need to let the team or our manager or clients know our plans. And ask for help with tasks when they're hard. This was actually a recommendation from my project manager this summer um, when things were getting a little wild. Um, I have a tendency to do it myself, right? But asking for help really is a sign of strength because it allows the problem to be solved faster and cheaper. So you can reach out for help in your work Slack. Um, you could use the Bad Camp Slack now if you've joined that. Uh, other community Slacks like Drupal Slack. Um, you could also try CodeMentor.com. It provides a network of folks that can help you. Um, and you can request non-disclosure agreements when you work with them. And you can hire them by the hour. So I recently helped someone understand Git and how to set up her development workflow. And it was kind of cool, right? So also embrace flexibility in your schedule and environment. You know, I'm speaking to managers here as well to allow your teams and employees flexibility when things are rough. Um, for your schedule of work hours, work in the morning or work at night, you know, whenever you feel most productive. And don't spend your wheels solving a problem, right? Uh, take a break, go for a walk, and you'll return with a fresh perspective. Uh, that was something that I've learned in the last year, and it's great. And for your environment, a lot of folks are probably still working from home. I work remotely, so it can be a little bit easier for me to relocate. Uh, so you can work from the patio, the kitchen table, the couch, outside a coffee shop, wherever it is that you feel most productive, you wanna work there. And you wanna practice self-care as you're able to. You know, you don't wanna take on habit management when you're in burnout. For example, this is not the time to stop smoking, right? Take breaks because time away improves productivity do relaxation activities as you're able. So, you know, the meditation we just talked about, um, one minute, three minutes more, um, this can help with the feeling of not being able to breathe. It also helps with focus, but know that it can be harder to do when you're stressed. You know, consider watching a movie or an episode of a show. You know, this was my go-to this summer. Um, it allowed me to relax, put my computer and phone away and just get lost in the Marvel universe. And most importantly, use Positive self-talk, okay? I often beat myself up over arbitrary standards, like getting to work early in the morning. Doing that adds stress and makes things harder. So once I embraced the flexibility, I was able to get things done. <clears throat> so just remember, this is a journey of imperfection, okay? There are a ton of books, articles, tips, and tricks out there. Whatever you do, do what works for you and what helps you be the person you want to be. So I have some resources in the slides. The slides are actually already on the session on the website if you wanna download that. Um, we've got the help guide. Excuse me, let me take a little water. <clears throat> There's also this site called Thrive Global. Uh, Ariana Huffington of Huffington Post actually experienced burnout. She, uh, she fainted because of exhaustion and hit her head on her desk. And it was kind of a wake up call for her so she started this company and this website to help people not burn out, um, to help people uh, you know, have better work-life balance and things like that. So it's a really cool resource. And then these are all the books that I mentioned throughout. Um, 
don't see anything about the these are all links in the PDF. <coughs> And then uh, one of the first books that I read after I burned out was uh, by Sarah Knight, uh, Get Your Stuff Together, uh, something like that. Uh, she has a lot of great books. It's really funny if you're okay with a little bit of saucy language. Um, highly recommend that. She has some other books that are great as well. And The Myth of Multitasking was a great book. Uh, very concise, so I couldn't summarize it um, so well, but... Uh, highly recommend that. It gives you a lot of the statistics about what multitasking does to you, right? All right. So thank you. And if you have any other questions, I'm here. Let's see, Amy June, are you going to help me with questions or there we go. Um, I didn't see any in back scroll, just lots of comments. Cool. And there's Mike joining the session late, as always. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, okay. You already have, uh, you should get uh, royalties for selling the book. <laughs> I, I did not. They are Amazon links, but I did not put affiliate links in there. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to. I need to get my web. I need to redo my website. You know, the one that's still from like 2005, and I can share all the books and all the resources that I have on there. Some one day, someday. Now here's a question. A question. the question is: How do you notice when a relaxation or play habit is being harmful? procrastination rather than helpful right yeah and like if my play habit is playing video games you know video addiction video game addiction is a thing as well right um <laughs> that's kind of a hard one right so at some point you do have to return to your computer and do the work right so i have a tendency where i'm like oh i'm gonna go for a walk and i'm gonna solve the problem in my head and that actually doesn't work but breaking away from something and thinking about other things and then coming back actually helps you see things with a more with a fresh perspective and solve the problems. Um, I think you just have to pay attention to like that moderation, right? Everything's great in moderation except moderation. So if you're doing things a lot, like you're playing a video games a lot, then that might be um, a bad habit at that point. <laughs> and what sleep schedule works for me? For me, I end up, I can't go to sleep at night and I can't get up in the morning. That's just the gist of it right there. Um, I tried going to bed earlier, but, you know, I also have dogs and the dogs like to get up at 4 a.m. And the dogs like to go out late at night. So it just kind of happens and it's just something I'm trying to fix. <laughs> I'm working on it for sure. I did set an alarm at 930 every night one time. Uh, to remind me to let the dogs out and let that be sort of like the shutdown routine, I guess, like the, the, uh, okay, it's time to go to bed and get ready for bed. And I set, uh, the, uh, Amazon. Okay. I don't think I have her in here. I set Alexa and everybody else might hear it. I set Alexa to play who let the dogs out at nine 30 every night to remind me to let the dogs out. So it would be kind of funny too, but the wife wasn't too happy with that after a while. <laughs> Um, but yeah, as Tori says, it's a journey of imperfection, right? We can't, you know, I'm such a perfectionist and I beat myself up about it. It's like, if I sleep, I sleep. I do focus on getting sleep because I know that I require it. Um, nope. <laughs> Soon looks like I've started playing who let, to let the dogs out on Donna's Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> what headset do I have? I have the Jabra, what is it? The Jabra 370. It's a wireless thing. It's wireless and you can plug it in, which is what I like. So if it starts to die, just plug it in and it starts working.
Thanks, Jordana. <laughs> I actually had to replace my headset because my cats were chewing on the cord. Darn cats. Can't have a ball. I can't sit on a ball at my desk because the cats go with their nails, pop it. All right. Yeah, so I think that's all the questions, unless anybody has any more. You can always reach me on the Twitter.